This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1034, recorded on August 10th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Does the uh, COVID case numbers continue to rise, Daniel? Um, I have to say the COVID case numbers are getting high enough now, and actually the hospital admissions high enough. We're actually we're having a discussion. Do we need to have a COVID ward? Um, just because you know so many folks are getting admitted. So yeah, the numbers are still increasing, um, and you know this is happening in several areas of the country. We have our theories, um, you know, just standard infection things, right? You know, transmission, people are inside, they're gathered, and uh, this is a respiratory pathogen. So yeah, I think the, the, the answer is, Daniel, that uh, August is the new December. <laughs> is that what it is? Okay. Yeah. And I see you wearing orange because orange is the new black. But okay. <laughs> All right, let me jump right in with our quotation. Um, Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we run faster, stretch out our arms farther. And then one fine morning, so we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. And uh, there are a couple reasons why that F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, quotation from the end of The Great Gatsby will be relevant today. Uh, maybe one of them was the one you just brought up. Uh, you know, so many people thought we were through this. And now I'm getting a lot of people saying, you know, I sort of wished I could forget about COVID. But now I feel like I need to be up to date on what's going on. So we're still here. And after a couple mentions of RSV and influenza, we'll get right into COVID. But first, I think this is on um, a lot of people's mind, getting a lot of questions about this. The U.S. CDC Advisory Committee unanimously recommended routine use of Bay Fortis, that's the Nursa VMAB, uh, to protect infants against RSV disease. Um, and actually, this is quite sweeping. What, were, what did the advisory committee recommend? I had to read this a couple times, but recommendation for use in all infants below eight months of age. Um, also, unanimously to include Bay Fortis in the Vaccines for Children program, supporting equitable access for all eligible infants. So interesting. This is a, um, a MAB, a monoclonal antibody, but it's being put in the vaccine. It's being treated like a vaccine. Um, and uh, so the Bay Fortis uh, approved for um, protection of all infants um, will be, and I think this is important, they say available ahead of the 2023-2024 RSV season. So uh, just to sort of put this together, the U.S. Centers for, for CDCNP, so the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Advisory Committee um, on Immunization Practices, um, voted unanimously 10 to 0 to recommend the routine use um, of Nursevimab, Bay Fortis, so this is Sanofi and AstraZeneca's product for the prevention of RSV, lower respiratory tract disease for newborns and infants below eight months of age, born during or entering their first RSV season. Um, so these provisional ACIP recommendations will be forwarded to the director of the CDC and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for review and possible approval. Um, the official recommendation will then be published in the CDC's MMWR, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. So we had a good uh, discussion of this by Paul Offit on the most recent Beyond the Noise. All right. Excellent. I haven't listened to that yet. I've got to, somehow I've got to get it so it like f comes up as a feed and I hear it right away. So I look forward to hearing that. Um, all right. Flu, it's already August and flu season will be here soon. Uh, some people may already be thinking about the, the coming influenza season. So we have the article, Immunogenicity, 
Safety and Preliminary Efficacy Evaluation of OVX-836, a nucleoprotein-based universal influenza A vaccine candidate, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase 2A trial published in The Lancet Infectious Diseases. Um, In this phase 2A randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study, they recruited 137 healthy adults aged 18 to 55 years in a single center in Belgium. Participants were randomly assigned to receive one single intramuscular administration of the OVX-836 influenza vaccine at three doses. The two primary endpoints were the safety and the cell-mediated immune responses to um, OVX-836 at the three doses in terms of change in nucleoprotein-specific interferon gamma spot-forming cell frequencies in the peripheral blood population. Um, So they're measuring um, interferon gamma LE spot um, at day eight versus pre-injection baseline day one. The OVX-836 increased the frequency of these nuclear protein-specific interferon gamma um, cells, SFCs, so spot-forming cells, um, per million PBMCs from days one to eight. That was the primary endpoint in a dose-dependent manner compared to placebo, dose-dependent and polyfunctional um, nuclear protein-specific CD4 T-cell responses were observed. CD8 T-cell responses were elicited at the 300 microgram and the 480 microgram as secondary endpoints. So they concluded uh, quite encouraging. OVX-836 appears to be a safe and well-tolerated candidate vaccine that elicits humoral and cellular nucleoprotein-specific immune responses, including CD8 T-cells at the highest dose levels, and showed a preliminary signal of protection against influenza. So um, OVX-836 is a promising vaccine candidate for universal influenza A prevention that they say, and I agree, warrants further trials. Unfortunately, this, like so many great articles, is behind a paywall. So they will have to do it an efficacy trial to see if it actually prevents influenza. Yeah. I mean, this is interesting. This is a phase 2A, so we really need that phase 3 efficacy yeah. trial. It's great. It's, it's safe. We're, we're seeing um, you know, these immune responses. Uh, but yeah, what we really want to know is, does it work? So now we're into COVID and a lot of, a lot of questions now. I think when COVID uh, numbers and COVID hospitalizations rise, people suddenly um, sort of come back and ask what's going on. So one of the things that's been um, in the press, in the news lately is ERIS or EG.5, uh, but also what about FL.1.51? Um, so here in the Northeast, is it the end of the XBB period? Uh, big question is how will um, changes in the variants impact our booster plans, right? So the, the whole idea, right, is let's make some XBB variants sort of trying to predict the future, as Yogi Berra says, the hardest thing to do. Um, And so if you look at our region two, that's where we live here in the Northeast, uh, but you can actually look at variants across the country and we'll leave in a link. Um, You can actually see that uh, EG.5 and FL.1.5.1 are actually really uh, making some inroads um, relative to all the XBB variants that we've been living with for quite some time. Moving on to post-exposure testing. Uh, How do you keep yourself safe? Well, this is a fun article, a little bit gross. So, uh, you know, for the children that might be listening, um, we have the article, Why Not to Pick Your Nose? Association between nose picking and SARS-CoV-2 incidents, a cohort study in hospital healthcare workers published in PLOS One. So uh, for those parents and, well, just all of us who need another reason to uh, discourage nose picking, these are the results of a cohort study where they looked at 404 healthcare workers in two university medical centers in the Netherlands. Um, SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies were prospectively measured during the first phase of the pandemic. And for this study, healthcare workers received a retrospective survey regarding behavioral and physical features. Now, only about 52%, only about half of the healthcare workers completed the survey. And 15.5% became SARS-CoV-2 seropositive during follow-up from March 2020 till October 2020. 
Now, the majority of healthcare workers, are you ready for this, Vincent? 84.5% reported picking their nose, at least incidentally, with frequency varying between monthly, all right, weekly, and daily. SARS CoV 2 incidence was highest in the nose picking healthcare workers compared to participants who refrain from nose picking, 17.3% versus 5.9%. Now, that's an odds ratio of 3.8. What I did find was, um, well, maybe this is, I, I wish they'd found this as well because I'm, I'm also a stickler for people who are chewing on their nails, but no association observed uh, between the nail biters, those that wore glasses, or those with beards and the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. I wonder how they posed this question. They just said... <laughs> Do you pick your nose or do they say, you know, I think do, that was the binary. That's do you pick it? your nose? Yes or no? And then it was how often? Is it just incidental? Is it once a month? Do you do this every week? Are you doing it every day? So, Daniel, do you pick your nose? <laughs> of course not. That's disgusting. <laughs> no, I, I, I have I, a feeling that many people do, but they don't realize it. Yeah, I, I think that's sort of interesting. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's people who pick their nose and there's people who lie about it. So. So the idea would be that you have some virus on your fingers that you got from someone else, and then you put it in your nose by picking your nose, right? Yeah, I think, you know, that would be the idea here, because we're looking at people getting it. So you're not, you're not getting it by picking your nose, you're getting it by introducing it into your nose. So this isn't transmission to others. I mean, the other side would be, you know, observing people who pick they know, their nose, are they more super spreaders than, you know? Mm -hmm. Those this, of us who deny picking their noses. I suspect this would apply to many respiratory infections, right? Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting that the nail biting wasn't associated. So just sort of, you know, something about the transmission here. I'm happy about the beard result. I, I was looking at your beard as <laughs> I was going through that. Uh, that actually came up today as this interesting issue that, you know, you, you're, you need to be fit tested for the N95 masks, right? Mm -hmm. And they go on, they form a seal. But if you have if you have certain facial hair um, patterns, um, the CDC basically says, you know, that's not going to work. You're not going to be able to get a good good seal. Um, so like your beard, a proper beard, right? That's, that's not going to work. I remember I was talking to Brian Lair and he's kind of got this goatee thing going, which maybe you <laughs> can sort of get a mask to surround that and still form a good seal. But no, it's a bit of a problem. If, you, if your job requires you to be in a situation where you need the benefit of an N95 and your facial hair doesn't give you a, a proper seal, then yeah, you're going to be at risk in those settings. So. Well, you know, right. it, now that we don't mask any longer, the beard is not really going to have an impact, right? Yeah, it's really the healthcare workers, right? Those of us that yeah. are still, you know, going into the rooms and, you know, spending some time breathing in and, you know, trying to keep ourselves safe. So, all right. The article, Effect of COVID-19 Vaccination and Booster on Maternal Fetal Outcomes, a retrospective cohort study was published in Lancet Digital Health. So I will warn, right? I warned the other one was like gross where we talked about nose picking. This is going to be where I get emotional and, and you get a probria, but repetition is critical in this arena. Um, so here we have the results of a retrospective multi-center cohort study on the impact of COVID-19 vaccination on maternal fetal outcomes for people who delivered at Providence St. Joseph Health. Um, that's an N of 106,428 across seven Western U.S. states from January 26, 2021 to October 26, 2022. This is really this question of, is it important for uh, for pregnant individuals to get vaccinated? Um, is this going to protect them? Is it going to protect the unborn child? Well, cohorts were defined by vaccination status at delivery. So we had vaccinated. Um, we had folks with two or more doses of mRNA-1273 Moderna or the um, Pfizer-BioNTech. And then we had unvaccinated. Um, unvaccinated propensity score matched. We had boosted, vaccinated, unboosted. Um, the primary outcome was maternal SARS-CoV-2 infection, COVID-19 vaccination status at delivery, COVID-19 related healthcare, preterm birth, stillbirth, and very low birth weight were calculated um, as secondary outcomes. So, you know, uh, maybe I'm not as interested in this first um, outcome, but I will comment. They found that vaccinated pregnant people had lower rates of COVID-19 during pregnancy compared with unvaccinated people. 
All right. Um, but now this is the take home message and why I'm going to actually stand on my soapbox and say it is irresponsible to discourage um, women from getting vaccinated. They found that unvaccinated people were more likely to have one preterm birth two, they were twice as likely to have a stillbirth. 50% more likely to have a very low birth weight neonate. So not only do we protect the pregnant individual, but we actually protect the unborn child from, from, from dying, from not actually surviving the pregnancy. So I just want to point that out because your, you know, your professional society recommends that you advise pregnant individuals to get vaccinated. So I know there's some OBs out there who are um, not really on board. All right. And just I should point out while we're talking about vaccines, uh, we are hearing that those updated uh, vaccines will be available by the end of September. Uh, we'll be uh, giving people updates in time regarding the potential benefits, which populations uh, would benefit from those. Um, but one of the other things about vaccination um, is inflammation. Inflammation is not good, right? Well, we also have the article Dynamics of Inflammatory Responses After SARS-CoV-2 Infection by by vaccination status in the USA, a prospective cohort study published in the Lancet Microbe. So, okay, some sorts of inflammation are good, but let's see what we're looking at here. This is a very simple study with an important result. These are the results of a longitudinal prospective cohort study where blood samples were used from participants enrolled in a multi-center randomized trial assessing the efficacy of convalescent plasma uh, for ambulatory COVID-19. The trial was conducted in 23 outpatient sites in the USA. In this study, participants were 18 or older, um, those who had COVID-19 before vaccination or with infections post-vaccination, who had blood samples and symptom data collected at screening, so a pre-transfusion, a day 14 and a day 90 visit, um, association between COVID-19 vaccination status and concentrations of 21 cytokines and chemokines um, were examined using this multivariate linear mixed effects regression model that they adjusted for age, sex, BMI, hypertension, diabetes, etc. They found that the concentrations of a number of the interleukins, um, as well as interferon gamma, inducible protein 10, monocyte chemo, attractant protein 1, and TNF-alpha were significantly lower among the fully vaccinated than the unvaccinated group. Um, on day 90, fully vaccinated participants had approximately 20% lower concentrations of IL-7, IL-8, vascular endothelial growth factor A than the unvaccinated. So right up front, that vaccination is preventing you from having this, this cytokine storm um, and also protecting you, you know, when you follow folks out over time. All right. Now, moving into the early viral upper respiratory non-hypoxic phase, right? So you've tested positive. Um, either you've tested positive, your patient has tested positive. So I know there's a bunch of folks that are, are, are coming back to listen again um, now that COVID is uh, becoming more of a thing. Um, number one, what do we recommend? Paxlovid in anyone who has a, uh, a high risk of progression. So that's over the age of 50, a number of comorbidities. Um, it's an easy lift, remember, twice a day for five days. We're looking at renal function. We're looking at drug-drug interactions and working through those. Number two, remdesivir, three-day early IV access. Um, Malnupiravir, Thor's hammer, sort of our third option, um, maybe about a 30% reduction compared to that 80 to 90% reduction progression we saw. Convalescent plasma, really restricted to the early outpatient treatment of immunocompromised individuals. Um, we're not doing harmful or useful things. But one of the big things people keep asking is, yeah, I don't really think I'm going to end up in the hospital. I don't really think I'm going to end up on a ventilator or not survive this, but I'm really worried about long COVID. So the big question is around what we can do during this early viral phase that might provide protection. So I uh, got a call just yesterday from uh, one of my partners, Dr. Lee. Uh, apparently metformin is, is out there on social media. Um, we've discussed the potential benefit of Paxlovid, um, the limited evidence from the COVID out trial that metformin may be an inferior option with an associated complicated dosing regimen for those that cannot access Paxlovid, remdesivir, or malnupiravir. 
But what about early treatment with monoclonal antibodies? The article, Does Monoclonal Antibody Treatment for COVID-19 Impact Short and Long-Term Outcomes in a Large Generalizable Population? Well, a retrospective cohort study in the U.S. was recently published in BMJ Open. Um, as the first author, I'm a bit partial to this one. Um, not really the answer I wanted, but here are the results. A sample of 3,809 individuals who received monoclonal antibodies and a matched one-to-one -one comparison group from a set of 327,079 eligible patients who did not receive monoclonal antibody treatment uh, was selected from a de-identified administrative data set. We found that individuals who received MAB, for some good news, were 28% less likely to be hospitalized. So like this is real world. You're not always getting it in in those first three to five days like you would ideally want. Um, so that's a hazard ratio of 0.72. 41% less likely to be admitted to the ICU, hazard ratio of 0.59. Um, but then we found that a higher proportion of individuals who received MAB therapy um, received care for clinical sequelae in the po post-acute phase, and that was a p-value of less than 0 0.02. So while we again verified in this large generalizable population, real world, that monoclonal antibody therapy was associated with benefits in the acute period, the benefit did not extend into the post-acute period, uh, did not reduce the risk for clinical sequelae. Seems that 28% is rather low, Daniel. What, what do you think is the reason for that, you know, not getting it early enough? I think that's the biggest issue is a lot of people, you know, and we tried as much as possible, right? And the trials, you, you're getting people in, you know, and, and the median time in those trials was about three days from symptom onset. But when you start looking at real world logistics, I mean, a lot of places like, you know, go online, the doctor mm. puts stuff in, the patient gets a call, they get scheduled two to three days later. Maybe it's even worse on the weekend. So a lot of folks were not getting it as early as we really need to get these uh, therapies in there. Moving on to the second. Now the patient has ended up in the hospital. So a refresher for those uh, coming back to join us. You know, you end up in the hospital. That oxygen saturation is less than 94%. So dexamethasone, six milligrams a day times six days. Uh, please update those order sets. Um, number two, anticoagulation. Uh, we have recommendations from American Society of Hematology. Um, you know, in general, I think most people are doing a prophylactic dose, um, but in some individuals um, who sort of match what we saw earlier in the pandemic, a full dose, um, pulmonary support, um, still have that proning out there, remdesivir, if you're in the first 10 days, uh, but once you're past that, we're really not seeing benefit. Immune modulation, certain patients will benefit from tocilizumab, the IL-6 receptor blocker. Um, avoid those unnecessary antibiotics proven and unproven therapies. Remember, this is a virus, not something we want to throw antibiotics at willy-nilly. All right, and moving on to the part which um, I sort of expected would become a significant chunk, but long COVID late phase, the article persistent endothelial dysfunction in post-COVID-19 syndrome and its associations with symptom severity and chronic inflammation was recently published in the journal Angiogenesis. So these are the results of a prospective observational cohort study where they analyzed retinal microcirculation using this retinal vessel analysis in a cohort of patients with PCS, that's post-COVID syndrome or long COVID, compared to an age and gender matched healthy cohort. Um, the PCS patients exhibit persistent endothelial dysfunction as indicated by significantly lower venular Flicker-induced dilation, that's a new one for a lot of us, narrower central retinal artery equivalent and lower arteriolar venular ratio. Um, when they combined these scores, uh, they reached good ability to discriminate the groups um, and the association of microvascular changes with PCS severity were amplified in PCS patients exhibiting higher levels of inflammatory parameters. So I'm not an ophthalmologist, so I love having the graphical abstract to help me here. <laughs> um, and I, I do recommend, take, take a look at this. Um, and apparently the, the RVA, right, so this, um, this analysis uh, was performed using this this commercial product. Um, 
It's made by the Germans. Um, they used another product to do the SVA measurements. Um, and before the examination, uh, the pupils were dilated. Um, they were seated in a quiet, dark room for a 10-minute rest period. And then they used this midriatic retinal camera. We actually get to see some of the images in the um, in the abstract here. So, um, yeah, a li little bit of uh, information support for the um, ongoing um, concern about persistent endothelial dysfunction in COVID nineteen. I have to say, Daniel, this curve they have of this reduced flicker induced dilation. <laughs> Okay. Yes. So, so the the curves are exactly the same, except the peak in the in the healthy people is a hundred four percent, and the peak in the people with long COVID is a hundred three percent. So one percent. I don't know if that is of any clinical significance because I don't know this assay at all, but it seems pretty close to me, doesn't it? <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty close. This is, you know, where you need that statistician to to work with us to mm. to help. Um, yeah. But we were getting p-values, you know, they tell us of 0 0.02, 0 0.01, uh, 0 0.007. So, they're, I mean, they're seeing statistically significant. Um, now, clinically, that, that becomes the issue. I think this supports the theory of an ongoing endothelial dysfunction, inflamed endothelial um, driving this. But no, this is, uh, I think that's a, that's a well-placed comment. Um, so, that's it. I guess it's all endothelial dysfunction. We have the answer. Is long COVID all about endothelial dysfunction? Um, well, we also have the article, core mitochondrial genes are downregulated during SARS-CoV-2 infection of rodent and human hosts published in Science Translation Medicine. So there's a nice editor's summary by Orla Smith. I'll read that. Um, SARS-CoV-2 needs host cells to generate molecules for viral replication and propagation. Um, in this article, Guarneri et al. Probably pronouncing that wrong. Can you, can you pronounce that, Vincent? What is that? It's a Guarneri. Perfect. Now show <laughs> <laughs> that the virus is able to block expression of both nuclear encoded and mitochondrial encoded mitochondrial genes, resulting in impaired host mitochondrial function. Um, the authors analyzed human nasopharyngeal samples and autopsy tissues from patients with COVID-19 and tissues from hamsters and mice, them's the rodents, infected with SARS-CoV-2. Host cells attempt to compensate here they're anthropomorphizing, by activating innate immune defenses and mitochondrial gene expression, but chronically impaired mitochondrial function ultimately may result in serious COVID-19 sequelae such as organ failure. So I'm sorry that Orla Smith anthropomorphized there, but all right. SARS-CoV-2 viral proteins um, appear to bind to host mitochondrial proteins um, such as OxFos stimulating glycolysis. So here the investigators analyzed mitochondrial gene expression in, as I mentioned, nasopharyngeal and autopsy issues um, from patients with COVID-19. In nasopharyngeal samples with declining viral titers, the virus um, blocked, say, was associated with blocking up the transcription of a subset of nuclear DNA encoded mitochondrial OXFOS genes, induced the expression of microRNA 2392, activated HIF1-alpha to induce a glycolysis, and activated host immune defenses, including the integrated stress response. Um, so I, I think it's important to break this down. I'm going to do this, um, you know, because people just sort of want a binary here, but timing has always mattered in COVID-19. So in, auto in autopsy tissues, autopsy tissues from patients with COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 the virus was no longer present, and mitochondrial gene transcription had recovered in the lungs. However, nuclear DNA, mitochondrial gene expression, remained suppressed in autopsy tissue from heart and to a lesser extent kidney and liver, whereas mitochondrial DNA transcription was induced and host immune defense pathways were activated. So during early... SARS-CoV-2 infection of hamsters with peak lung viral load, mitochondrial gene expression in the lung was minimally perturbed, but was downregulated in the cerebellum, upregulated in the striatum, even though no SARS-CoV-2 was detected in the brain. During the mid-phase of SARS-CoV-2 infection of mice, mitochondrial gene expression was starting to recover in mouse lungs. Um, so the authors say that these data suggest that the viral titer first peaks 
there's a systemic host response. Then we get viral suppression of mitochondrial gene transcription, induction of glycolysis, leading to the deployment of antiviral immune responses. And even when the virus was cleared and lung mitochondrial function had recovered, mitochondrial function in the heart, the kidney, the liver, and the lymph nodes remained impaired, um, as they say, potentially leading to severe COVID-19 pathology. Um, also, again, a great graphical abstract. So fortunately, this is behind a paywall. So thanks to my... Uh, my Columbia access, um, but again, a nice, nice breakdown where you really see the uh, the distinction between early stage, late stage, um, and you know the different tissues. I would have liked to see a comparison with another virus, you know, to see how general this effect is, or if it's specific to this virus. I like that actually. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So maybe we're starting to just learn a little bit about virology in general. Yeah, how much of what we're learning uh, translates to other viral infections. And all right, we will wrap it up here. Hopefully we're still within your attention span. Um, as I've been saying for a number of years now, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And I do want everyone to pause the recording right here. Go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and click Donate. We are now doing our Floating Doctors fundraiser for August, September, and October, where we double your donations uh, up to a potential maximum donation of $20,000 to help floating doctors continue to do their work in Panama. Time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to Daniel at microbe.tv. Mary writes, my question is, I was able to get a just-in-case prescription of Paxlovid to start immediately if COVID should get through, despite my precautions. If I have a rebound, I know it's not a Paxlovid rebound, would it be helpful to take a second course of Paxlovid or might it be worth seeking out remdesivir? I'm not so much concerned about a severe initial case of COVID because I'm vaxxed with the most recent booster in May, although I hate to be sick with anything, but I'm interested in avoiding the long-term sequelae of long COVID, organ damage, et cetera. All right. So we, we visited this many times, but I'm glad repetition is going to really matter here. So think about what you're doing. The first week is when you have significant viral replication. That's the perfect time for an antiviral. That's why it's five days. That's why three days with remdesivir during the first week is appropriate. Now, the viral replication goes down. Maybe you're getting an antigen test that's positive, negative. You're not seeing millions and millions of copies of, of the virus. You're, you're not seeing significant viral replication when during that second week you start to get symptoms. That second week is an inflammatory response, right? That's when we start thinking about treating with steroids. Early in the pandemic, this was a huge mistake that people made. They were trying antivirals during week two. During week three, they were showing no benefit. Actually, potentially, um, all the harms that come with jumping in with a with an antiviral that that has effects, but no benefit. So I know several prominent people have gone ahead, you have taken Paxlova during that second week, all kinds of ideas and hand waving about maybe it prevents long COVID, et cetera, et cetera. But this is an antiviral. The first week. The first five days is the ideal time to take it. If you start to get an early inflammatory response, which is after the viral replication has really shut down, there's no evidence to support that. Um, and there is the potential for harm. So I would recommend against taking another course of any antiviral. Catherine writes, thank you for making yourself available as a resource for all physicians trying to do our best in caring for patients. My partners and I, pediatricians, are curious about the recommendations for RSV vaccination with Bayfortis when a mother has had the RSV vaccine during pregnancy. Should we give Bayfortis as additional protection or would it be better to hold off until their second season for RSV? Do you think insurance companies will pay for the vaccine for babies if moms also received the RSV vaccine during pregnancy? Oh, so this is, a, this is a great question. Um, so, you know, just sort of walk through the science. So we, we know that that vaccination during the last trimester is going to provide protection for the newborns. So that's great. Um, we also know that the nurse of EMAB, the Bay Fortis, is going to provide pretty robust protection for these infants under eight months of age. Um, 
there, there's no reason to think that you're not going to get extra benefit. Um, and really, the, the data was was persuasive to the point that they're actually looking at this, treating this as a passive vaccination. Um, so, yeah, what would what would the science support? What would be my thought is don't you know, don't don't limit your use of nirsevimab just because the the pregnant individual got the vaccine. I think we're going to see benefits to both being given. Louise writes, I'm a family physician from suburban Philadelphia. I have a patient with inflammatory bowel disease and immunosuppressive therapy who just had a pap with positive HPV. Her gynecologist re recommends Gardasil vaccine, but it is only indicated for up to age 45. Any suggestions? Yeah, so that that was an interesting expansion. It was a pre COVID nineteen pandemic. Actually, I think twenty eighteen was when the FDA uh, expanded, sort of realizing that there there may be benefit, and there was some evidence supporting that. Um, you know, these are these are situations where clinical judgment. It is reasonable to think that this may be a helpful suggestion. The, the data is not compelling to the point that it's been FDA approved above that age, but I think that's a reasonable recommendation that's being made. Carolyn writes, could you please talk a bit about nirsevimab timing for infants? News reports state it will be out before RSV season in October. However, hasn't RSV season been earlier this past two years since COVID? RSV went around my older child's class in September last year, and I'm concerned nirsevimab won't be available before my infant is exposed. As parents, I know we don't have control over the timing, but any info you could provide on RSV seasonality and the nirsevimab availability process would be appreciated. Yeah, so this is great email. So thank you for asking this because right as I started right up front, we're being told it's going to be ready for the RSV season. Well, when is the RSV season? Things have changed quite a bit. What happens if RSV comes early this year like it did last year? What if we start seeing cases in September? Is it going to be ready for then or are they talking about the the typical sort of October um, delivery of this? So really, as soon as it's available, um, people should should go out there, uh, you know, get the benefit that's going to be there. But you make a really good point. When is RSV going to be here? Saying that it's going to be here before the season is predicting the future. And Diana writes, Dr. Griff in the hospital where my physician affiliates does not carry remdesivir because they say it is ineffective. Is this true? I don't think I can swallow Paxlovid. Do I have any options other to end up on a ventilator? This is upsetting. Yeah, no. Th this is this is very upsetting, and you know, and here maybe I'll vent a little bit. I remember during the pandemic, like having conversations with medical directors of different facilities who had, you know, they were not boarded in infectious disease. They did not have the background, but they had an administrative uh, title, and they were making comments, for instance, about you know when we weren't allowed to use tocilizumab without their approval, the approval of an administrative uh, person, not necessarily a board certified infectious disease doctor. So um, when I hear this. Like they have decided. I'm very curious who they are. I'm very curious who is who is having input into this. I know that the early outpatient remdesivir um, is in most situations not really financially in the best interest of the institution, but it is in the best interest of the patient. So I applaud institutions that go ahead and do that. A couple things just to say the pine tree data, you get remdesivir within the first seven days. 87% reduction in progression. That's fantastic. If you can get remdesivir within the first 10 days, and there are going to be patients who end up in the hospital, um, then there is benefit. Once you get past 10 days, once you end up in an ICU, on a ventilator, okay, then the window has closed. Um, but there's subtleties here, and remdesivir at the right time in the right patient can be a tremendous tool. I don't know what to say to Diana then, right? To Move to New York. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe.